students, um, welcome to our second unit in grade 10 science and we get to discover our biology and we're looking at cells and tissues, organs, organ systems. So we're looking at the basic building blocks of life and some of the concepts we're going to cover in this lesson are basic biology concepts where we're going to look at the structure and function of the things that make up cells and just get a brief overview of what happens inside of these little factories that are cells. Then we're going to start talking about what makes some cells different from other cells, okay? Because you're going to recognize that a muscle cell is going to look different than a nerve cell, which is going to look different than a red blood cell. And we're also going to factor in the fact that within each type of cell, they all do the same kinds of jobs, okay? So each cell has a nucleus, right? And the nucleus has a particular job. But then depending on the type of cell that you have, the job for those cells is going to be a little bit different, okay? So we start looking at the micro scale, and then we'll end up this unit looking at the macro scale. So we're going to look at how cells are the building blocks of life. Okay, so we're going to start today's lesson by looking at just some basic biology terminology. Then we're going to focus on the organelles, which are the parts inside of the cell. And so I'm not going to make this lesson too long, the video, because there's a lot of work you're going to do. Okay, you're going to be looking at um, creating a table where you've got the structure and the function. You're going to be looking at how to label a cell, um, the different parts of the cell, and you may remember some of these parts from grade 8 science when you learned about the mitochondria, maybe you heard the vacuoles before, okay? And so learning about what the structure looks like, how you would identify it in a diagram, and then what does that structure do? And that's one of the big ideas in biology. We talk about structure and function. So we mean, what is it? What is it called? What does it look like? And then what does it do? So that once you understand those as the basic um, components of our learning for biology, then you can start to apply it to some of the more difficult concepts, okay? So if you enjoy our biology unit in grade 10, you'll certainly love uh, the grade 11 biology course, which you then have the option to sign up for. Okay? All right, so let's go over some basic biology to start with, and that is on this handout here. Again, make your note in whatever form you'd like. You'll recognize that this note corresponds to section 2.1 in the biology um, chapter within our textbook. Okay, so we're now moving into chapter 2, 3, 4 is the, is the section that we're in, and so we're going to look at the cell theory. This is where we sort of start thinking about, like, well, what, what what concepts did scientists come up with to begin with, okay? And so from a classical interpretation, you can just sort of read through that, um, they've developed more of a modern version of the cell theory. And here are the three main points. One, energy, okay? Energy flow occurs within a cell. So we're talking about metabolism. This is the concept where, yes, you ate a banana for breakfast, for example, it, gets digested in your digestive system, the nutrients that your body breaks down ends up flowing through your bloodstream to every single cell in your body. Those nutrients, specifically a glucose molecule, need to get into the mitochondria and actually change that molecule into a form of energy. So is it a very complex process? Absolutely. But that is one of the main parts of the cell theory. So we're looking at energy flow and how that energy flows within a cell. And then how does that energy get from one cell to the next? And what does that energy actually do inside the cell? The second main idea in the cell theory is that hereditary information, and we know this to be DNA, right? Your DNA is passed on from one cell to the next. And in this unit, we get to talk about what that's called. It's actually called mitosis. And so it's how does the genetic information go from one cell into two when that cell grows and then divides into two? Well, there's some way for that DNA to get replicated and then spread out into two different cells. So we're going to cover that in our next lesson. Third point, all cells have the basic, the same basic structural composition. 
Okay, so they all have the same parts. And the basic model of the cell is that all cells do the same kinds of things. Okay, and we're going to look at what the structures are inside the cell, and then you'd be able to then say, right, so if you have a muscle cell or a nerve cell or a um, any other type of cell in your body, they all do the same types of jobs, but of course there's some specialization between those. Okay, cellular facts and basic biology. We spend a lot of time in grade 11 and 12 biology on some of these facts. So let's just go over a couple of the key terms. First, human bodies are made up between billions and trillions of cells all working together. And each cell is made up of smaller parts. And what do we call those? We call those the organelles. An organelle is a bit, a little piece of an entire cell. When we're looking at cells and the... Um, basically the evolution of cells. We'll get into that in much more detail in other courses. There are two main types of cells, and I'm going to show you what this looks like in the textbook, okay? There's one called a prokaryote and one called a eukaryote. And if you can see down below here, and this is section 2-1 in your textbook, okay, all organisms that are living things are broken down into two categories. A prokaryote, you can see down here below, is a bacteria. They're much more simplified than cells that make up you or me or every other living thing. So the two main categories, prokaryote, eukaryote, those are good terms to know, okay? A eukaryotic cell can then be a single-celled organism like the little amoeba down there in the diagram, or it could be a multicellular organism. And things then can be classified as either an animal or a plant. And then, of course, there are lots of other things that don't fit into those two general classifications. We could be talking about um, other uh, protists that are multicellular. We could also be talking about um, fungi, too. Okay, so that's one of the big definitions. And so when you're having a look at uh, the textbook, you're going to sort of go along and pick out, highlight those key definitions and that is one of them. So on this line right here, two major kinds of cells, all bacteria are prokaryotes, okay? And they have ribosomes, they don't have a membrane-bound organelles, and if you look inside that little E. coli down there, yeah, there's no bits and pieces, no organelles um, that you would recognize from a typical animal or plant cell, and that's what differentiates them. Scientists put them into two different categories because of that. Okay, so a eukaryote, and that's how you pronounce that, E-U-K-A-R-Y-O-T-E-S. And again, our eukaryotes are everything else. Anything that isn't a bacteria is under the umbrella term of a eukaryote. So are you a eukaryote or a prokaryote? You and me and all things that aren't bacteria are all eukaryotes. Okay? All right, the next part. Living things have specialized functions like movement and waste removal, intake of nutrients. All living things require energy to survive. Some living things that make their own food, do you remember a term from grade nine? Here's what it's called, an autotroph. Okay, an autotroph make their own food, while other living things are called heterotrophs. And you and me and plants are heterotrophs, oh, sorry, not plants. <laughs> plants. Plants make their own food and then they use their own food to make energy. So we are heterotrophs where you get your energy from something else. Okay, again, that's probably a term you remember from grade nine when you did ecosystems and how things combine and uh, work together to flow energy through all of the um, living things. Okay, cells are limited in how large they can grow, and that's what makes a cell decide it needs to divide, okay? Once a cell gets too big, then the surface area to volume ratio of that cell isn't efficient, okay? It takes too long for something to get all the way into the center of the cell if the cell is too big. Because remember, what kinds of things need to go into a cell and what kinds of things come out of a cell? Well, you know those oxygen molecules, need to get inside of every single cell for the reaction that takes place there, okay? And so once a cell starts to grow and get bigger, that surface area to volume ratio, that's what determines whether a cell is going to divide or not, okay? It's like a trigger for the cell. You get too big and, oh, you need to divide into two. So the surface area 
to volume ratio is what determines that. Okay, last big concept in biology is the idea that things need to be transported in a cell and out of a cell, right? Because things happen inside of a cell. And when I say things, I mean chemical reactions, right? So think about photosynthesis that's going to take place in the chloroplast. Think about cellular respiration that's going to take place in the mitochondria. If these chemical reactions require things like oxygen or carbon dioxide or glucose or water, or maybe they make those things, right, depending on the reaction that you're looking at, you've got to be able to get things in and out of the cell. Another thing that cells do is they make proteins. These could be things like enzymes. They could be hormones. They could be a structural piece. And so when a cell makes stuff, it needs to be able to get that stuff in and out of the cell, and to be able to have the energy and things to do that, it needs to be able to transport stuff across a cell membrane, okay? So here are a couple of big concepts, and I want you to think about these. So transport of materials like glucose for energy, or something called an amino acid to build proteins. We'll come back to this in another lesson or two. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, need to go across a cell membrane. In solutions, dissolved solids always move, here's the rule, they move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And my great example for this is just a simple one. If you had an orange um, in front of you and you started to peel that orange, it wouldn't take very long, would it, before those smells of an orange get from one area of a room to another area. They move by diffusion. So molecules are constantly moving and heat can cause molecules to move faster and farther apart, and we always know that they go from an area where they're highly concentrated to an area that they're not very concentrated, okay? What's that called? This process starts with the letter D. Does anybody know it? Diffusion, okay? The rate of these molecules pass across the membrane is simply relative to what we say is the membrane's permeability. Okay, how easily does it let things go across that barrier? Water also moves across the membrane, and because we talk about water moving in living systems all the time, we give it its own term. So the process by which water goes from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration is called osmosis. Okay, so that gives you a bit of a background as to getting started thinking about um, processes that take place in biology and some of the terms around them, okay? Now, I want to just show you in the textbook a couple of little pictures here, all right? And then I'm going to come back to the note. And I want to show you that once you've got um, a typical plant or animal cell, you will want to be familiar with the parts of the cell. Okay, so can you see on the left hand side we've got our typical plant cell and on the right hand side we have our typical animal cell. So what are you going to do? You're going to take these organelles that are labeled and we're going to create a table where you identify the structure, what it's called, and the function, what it does. And there's a couple of different ways that you're going to be working through these notes, okay? So let me just bring the note back up and I'll just show you what my note looks like, and then you are welcome to, again, create that note however you can, okay? However um, is easiest for you. You'll notice that our typical plant cell right here has some numbered labels on it. Animal cell does as well. I just added a couple here. You can check my solution set for the answers, but these numbers are also the same numbers that are in the data table. Okay, so here you go. Number one from our diagram was a lysosome. And so you're going to create a little list of what that function, what does it do? Okay, and I want you to think about this as creating a definition that's really sort of at a grade 10 level. All right, you'll be able to write a definition from the textbook about what a lysosome does. And then there are two different things you can do to add to your note. And so I want to, you to start with your table. I want you to start with your organelle and start with your function. You might want to leave a little bit of space, okay? So the first spot to start is your textbook, and you can simply 
use section 2.1, highlight a couple of things, right? There's, there's one little, one concept you want to make sure you give over, and that is how does a plant cell differ from an animal cell? What are the, what are the structural parts? There are three of them, so make sure you're looking out for those. How are they different? Okay, that's a question that people always ask, and it's on the back of this handout, so you'll be looking for that. Once you've created a nice table with some good definitions, uh, well, functions for all of the organelles, then you're going to be working through two different um, pieces of media to help add to your list. So really take your time and do a really good job at this. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to watch this little Amoeba Sisters video. Okay, it's linked on to our D2L classroom. I want you to watch this one. It's 10 minutes long. It gives you a brief overview of the cells. So once you've got your table created, watch the video, take your time, pause it, and add to any of those definitions that you need to. Okay, so you want to be a real active learner when you're doing this um, because, you know, once you've gone through it once, you can go through it again by watching the video. The third thing you're going to do and spend time on in your learning block number two or whenever you have a chance uh, to get started at it is to link to the gizmo. Okay, so in our Explore Learning gizmos, the one for today's lesson is about cell structure. And so if I just show you right here, you're going to do a typical ant cell, animal cell, a typical plant cell, and I want to let you use this for review. For review, meaning adding more information to the table that you've created, maybe this is a, t uh, a spot where you're just going to be practicing to see if you can identify what those organelles are. And then, of course, at the end of the gizmo, there's a quick little quiz, so I'd like you to give that a go. Okay, what are you submitting for today's lesson? When you're done all of your work, you are going to submit this little homework section down here. Okay, so you're going to make your in summary note on plants and animals. You're going to be creating, um, well, completing some homework questions, and you can send me a picture of all your work together. Okay, I hope that was fun. In our next lesson, we're going to look at um, now that we've talked about the organelles, we're going to look at the nucleus specifically. And we're going to talk about how DNA then um, makes proteins and actually does some of the functioning. When we say functioning of the overall cell, that is the main function of cells. Okay, so good luck with that and let me know how it goes.